Tom, thank you all very much for coming this evening and uh, it's a pleasure to be on the other side of the platform for once, mm -hmm. on the lecturing side rather than the chairing side. And um, I was asked, uh, you don't often get asked to do a talk, but I was actually asked to do this talk by Basingstoke Lodge because um, there was an article in the Scientific American called, by the title which I've dared to copy from them, called The Myth of the Beginning of Time. And it's quite a scientific article, and it goes far deeper into the scientific ideas and philosophies that lie behind this uh, particular thought than uh, it would be possible or wise to go into here this evening. However, it has all sorts of, of repercussions upon our attitude towards theosophy and metaphysics. Because, you, you know, the boundary between physics and metaphysics is a very blurred boundary. It doesn't um, have any particular uh, clear defining line. In a sense, nearly all science starts with a form of metaphysics, in the sense that it starts with postulates, which have to be proved or disproved, you know, and, and uh, scientists have been playing this game for hundreds of years of putting up postulates to suggest why um, nature behaves in a particular way and whether it is possible to generalise the way in which she behaves with writing particular laws or equations down to, to, to justify um, uh, extrapolation. Well, we'll go into this business of extrapolation uh, in a, a, a little while later on in the talk. But first of all, I want to, to, to just uh, broaden the issue in your minds as to the meaning of the word time as far as uh, this talk is concerned. Because most of the time we say, what is the time? We mean the time on our watch. Uh, we're interested in clockwork time, as I call it. The time which is based upon the speed at which the Earth rotates on its axis. And that is by far and away the most important thing, because by doing, uh, by relating our lives to clockwork time, we synchronise with each other. You know, if we uh, didn't have clockwork time, we decided to start this lecture a little after six o'clock, and half the people didn't really know whether it was six or seven o'clock and wandered in all the way through, and some came in right at the end, it'd be a bit of a disaster, wouldn't it? So the main reason for using clockwork time is that we synchronise. And in some countries of the world where they don't adhere particularly well to this business of, of synchronising time, um, you can wait hours to start a meeting until everybody arrives because um, it's so haphazard. So clockwork time serves us very well in our modern society and I'm not attempting in any way to pour scorn on it this evening. But I do want to draw your attention to the fact that clockwork time is very much for this planet. You know, if we were to go somewhere else in the Milky Way and find some other little solar system like ours with a, uh, a, a, an Earth that was habitable like this one is, and it was rotating at half the speed of this one, or three times the speed of this one on its axis, the time for our purposes would be entirely different. Whether we go to sleep more often or more frequently or whatever um, is another matter. And we'll come on to the question of what time is in that respect a little later as well. So, in many sense, the clockwork time is our perception of time. However, I'm sure most of you who read the title of tonight's talk will realise that the meaning of the word time in the title is a bit more comprehensive than that. Because we're not talking about how long this Earth has existed, how long it took to cool out of a, um, a, a swirling mass of hot gas and condense into liquids and finally into solids. Um, at least on its outside. It's still got plenty of hot liquids in the middle of it, as we know when we get volcanoes and earthquakes happening. But the, 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 the whole uh, structure of, of, of time, as we appreciate it, um, is dependent upon uh, the, the way in which the Earth has settled down into a habitable state. And that is quite different from saying when the universe came into existence, 
or how long it's got to go before it goes out of existence, if it goes out of existence. Whereas we're told by the scientists who study these things that the Earth itself will go out of existence in some distant point in the future when the, uh, the sun gets uh, hotter as it starts to die as a fiery planet uh, and the Earth becomes hotter and hotter and eventually merges with the sun, by which time, of course, life will have long since disappeared. But this is the end of the Earth. What we're talking about, and, and the beginning of the Earth, of course, is finite uh, in time, as we well know, because of the cooling process I've just referred to. However, when we come to time in relation to the universe, that's a different ball game altogether. Because in the case of the universe, there, the, the time scale is enormous. But it's not infinite. At least it wouldn't appear to be to be infinite. Because the galaxies appear, from all our observations of them, to be hurtling away from each other at some unbelievable speed. And they seem to have been doing it for millions of years. So that the, 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 the scope of the universe, it would seem, is huge far, far beyond anything that our human minds can begin to comprehend. The, 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 as you probably know, the light from the sun, which is 50 million, year, 50 million miles away from the Earth, takes 10 minutes to get here, because there's a speed of light being 186,000 miles per second. It takes 10 minutes for the light to get here from the sun. From the nearest star, I think that it takes five light years. Now, a light year is defined as the distance that light will travel in a year. So five light years is five times 186,000 times 360 seconds in the hour times 24 times 365. If you're good at mathematics, you may have worked out what that number is, but it's a huge number. And that's the sort of thing that um, it gives us some perspective on when we say that the nearest the galaxy to our Milky Way galaxy is probably a, a thousand uh, or perhaps a million light years away. Uh, the, the, the size of the universe is colossal. But even though the universe is so colossal, it fascinates people. It fascinates not only people who are professional mm -hmm. physicists, uh, and, and astrophysicists, but it fascinates ordinary people. How did it all begin? Why are we here? How did we come to be here, living at this strange life that we live on this planet, <coughs> with this strange <coughs> consciousness that we have, which we put down every night and pick up again in the morning, and, and, and which is so us, when our consciousness is extinguished, we appear to be extinguished as well. Uh, and anyone who's seen someone who's dead will know exactly what I'm talking about there. They look very different from a person who's sleeping. So there's all these aspects to it. And this is why I think this fascination with whether there was ever a beginning for the universe uh, in time uh, is so important and fascinates so many people. But on top of that, there is this fascination about whether if there was a beginning of time, what happened before that? <laughs> what happened before the beginning of time? Uh -huh. You see, that leaves you in a, in a strange sort of vacuum thought, doesn't it? Um, how could there be a time before time existed? You see? Uh, and you can see how, how, uh, why uh, scientists have, have, have struggled to construct a hypothesis, one of these things I was talking about at the start of the talk, to explain the beginning of time. And Gabriel Veneziano, who, who wrote this article in the magazine, he says it's a myth, the beginning of time. That there wasn't such a thing as a Big Bang. And if there was a Big Bang, that it was only part of a process that had long been in existence. Now, strangely, time and space are inextricably linked together in the consideration of this subject. In fact, it's said that the three fundamental quantities 
that define the whole universe in which we live, our mass, length and time. And it might, int might interest you to know, particularly those of you who are scientists but who haven't been in this particular field of science, that every single measurement that is made in the physical universe, in the physical world of physics, whether it's to do with electromagnetic quantities like magnetic flux, or whether it's to do with um, the measurement of, of liquids and their density, or, or to do with speed, or whatever it is, can be expressed in three fundamental quantities of mass, length and time. And in fact, in part of my re a particular stage of, of the, one of the research projects I was on, it was an incredibly useful concept, because you set up an equation of some sort, and in order to test whether that equation is valid, um, you can work out whether the mass, length and time on one side is uh, in the same quantities as it is on the other side, the number of units of mass and length. I mean, for example, you see, um, um, if you take uh, density, for example, it's mass per length cubed. There's all three dimensions, the volume, you see, of, of a liquid and its mass. So it's m over l cubed, or ml to the minus three, uh, and so on. And, and la likewise speed, uh, length per unit time, l upon t or L times T to the minus one. So, so these fundamental quantities are essential to the physical universe and you can't unravel them all together. And it might interest you also to know that th th there's, there's this strange concept of space and this comes very close to some parts of theosophical teaching as well. There's this strange concept of space that in fact it doesn't exist until something occupies it. So in other words, if the universe is expanding, it's not expanding into space, it's actually creating space as it expands. Because if the space was already there before the universe expanded into it, then the universe wasn't the limit of the expansion of the galaxies at all, it was some other quantity which defines how far space goes. And those of you who remember back into the 1960s may well remember that Professor Lovell, who was the a professor of astrophysics or something at um, Manchester University, I think it was. Um, he raised this huge sum of money to build the Jovrell Bank Telescope. Uh, and it's a radio telescope. It's, it's a, a huge disk which is totally steerable uh, in, in all directions, um, up and down, sideways, and, and round as well. And of course, it was a Again, those of you who can stretch your mind back that far will remember that we were the only people in the world who knew where the, the, the first spacecraft was. The Russians didn't even know where their own spacecraft was when they put their first Sputnik up because nobody had built a telescope like Professor Lovell had built. But the reason that he built the telescope was because he was fascinated with the possibility that there might be a limit to the universe. In other words, that the uni universe might be finite. And he believed that if he built a radio telescope, I mean optical telescope you can forget at these distances because there's no way, but if you build a radio telescope, a bit like the dishes that we use now for picking up television programs, but on a vaster scale, that you might be able to find out whether you could focus that dish so far out into space that you got radio silence. And then if you did manage to do that, you might, you might be reasonably justified in concluding that the universe was finite. Now, if it isn't finite, then that stretches us into a, a point in our imagination which is very similar to the point in our imagination where we get stretched when we look at the first fundamental proposition of theosophy, which Blavatsky put down in The Secret Doctrine, where she refers to the originating first cause of all existence being totally beyond the range and reach of human thought, and could only be dwarfed, she says, by any human similitude. And of course, it, 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 it it has to be that I, I turn aside a minute to look at this, because that concept is so different from the concept of God 
in any of the world religions, that the difference needs to be noted. Noted by every single person who comes to theosophy. Because here we're saying not that there's some God out there made in man's image who's listening to us and, and watching us getting on and you know wishing he could interfere more perhaps uh, and loving us or not loving us and all the things that are portrayed in the Bible and in other religious literature but a being that is so vast that he made the universe, this universe that I've just been describing which is so incomprehensible to us. And then to imagine a being that is able to produce that. <coughs> and not only that, but the mystery of human consciousness and all the subjective realms of thought and imagination that we talk about in our study of the human being in theosophy. There is a huge, huge subject out here. Now, now just, just to alter the, the picture very slightly and to, to recapitulate on what I've already said, uh, let me go back to this business of time again, because there are other things than the speed at which the Earth rotates on its axis. And we've utilised these other things in all sorts of ways in our modern society. One of the ways we've utilised them is the resonance of crystals. If you put, make a crystal out of certain chemical substances, it will have what we call a resonant frequency. If you energize it with an electric potential, um, you will find that the, the crystal will resonate at a certain frequency. And according to the, make, the makeup of the crystal, what chemicals are in it and so on, it will resonate at different speeds. And it is the speed of the resonance of the crystal, which means we, most of us got watches on now, which don't depend upon anything but the resonance of that crystal. And, and uh, all our watches as a counter, counting how fast the little crystal is resonating. So we've used, utilized it very helpfully in that way. Also, the speed at which chemical reactions take place. Some of them are very slow, some of them are terrifyingly fast, as in explosives. So these things have got nothing to do with the speed that the Earth rotates on its axis at all, uh, and is another reference point for time. But there's yet another reference point for time, which I'm coming on to later on, to do with duration. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Now, this Big Bang, big bang Theory that I mentioned a few minutes ago, that is described in a lot of scientific literature as a singularity. And you can see why the word singularity is used, I'm sure, all of you, because that is a word which says everything about what you believe about the Big Bang. Because it's saying to you, look, um, it only could ever have happened once. You see? And, of course, it, it pulls a lot of strings rings a lot of bells in people's minds because most of us have been brought up on, on Christianity and, and the idea that God created the heaven and the earth and, and there was a moment in time when God did it, <laughs> you see. Um, and, and so this idea that it only happened ever once and, and God never did it again, he's never needed to do it again because the earth has existed ever since he did it. Uh, and, and so that this idea of a singularity um, rings a lot of bells. However, there is this idea that if the Earth is expanding, that it might possibly get, get to a certain point where the gravitational pull between the galaxies draws it back in again, where there's some sort of velocity um, has been given to the galaxies and they start to converge again. And of course the um, um, I don't think it requires much um, imagination on anybody's part to realise that if they converge towards each other, um, towards um, a, 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 a very small volume, that the density of that volume becomes, uh, goes towards infinity as the volume goes towards zero. I don't think anyone has any problem with that, do they? You know, you squash something in your hand, uh, tighter and tighter and tighter, and the smaller you make the ball of dough or whatever it is in your hand, the denser it becomes. It's a very easy thing to imagine. Now the first thing that has um, 
provided an opportunity for a different point of view to become established was, of course, Einstein. Because <coughs> there came a point, after many hundred, several hundred years, uh, of Newton's theories of gravitational pull and, uh, and so on and so forth, when, uh, alarmingly, uh, scientists found out that a gravitational pull uh, and, and its effects uh, was not performing according to the way that Newton had predicted. And it took Einstein to come along with his theory of relativity uh, to show why Newton's laws had not performed as they should have done. And he discovered in his theory of relativity that contrary to all previous expectations, light as it travelled across the interstellar space, and even uh, probably the space of the solar system, uh, to some degree, or perhaps not a measurable degree, was bent by gravitational fields. Although the gravitational field is so mysterious that we can't feel it or touch it, uh, we know if we lift our leg up, we can feel the, the weight of our leg uh, because of the, it's there, but we can't actually describe it or see it or do anything about the gravitational field, uh, or the electromagnetic field for that matter, but the, the, in spite of all that, it's out there in space, making the light bend as it comes towards us. And you've got this extraordinary um, picture um, painted by... Um, people who tried to explain Einstein's theory um, in the early days when it was first being studied, that the shortest distance between two points is not a straight line but a curve. And you see, and the moment you hear that, um, you feel the ground beginning to move slightly under your feet, don't you? How could that possibly be? But in fact, um, in many senses, that is the truth where there are large gravitational fields, and um, as you know, the gravitational field of this Earth is pretty minimal. The gravitational field of the Sun is huge, the gravitational field of Jupiter is huge, because it's a much larger planet than, than this planet, according to the size of the planet, so the gravitational field, some gravitational fields on some planets are so strong that nothing can escape, and the, 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 the belt of gas around them, or air, is, is, is very, very uh, thick and dense indeed because of the strength of the field. Why, the, where the moon hasn't got any, any air because it's got such a small gravitational field that all the gas uh, that was once on it has escaped into space. So there are all these different aspects to it. But the fact that Einstein's theory had raised these strange... Um, a uh, sense of awareness in uh, physicists which previously wasn't there that they might not have bottomed out on the, the true reality of, uh, of, the, of nature as we see it around us. And as you know, uh, the history of science is uh, a history of disillusionment as far as man is concerned. Thought he knew the truth and found out afterwards that he only knew a little tiny bit of the truth. And the reason for that is partly because um, there is this process in science which is really very important to explain to you in the, per in the, in the relation to this particular talk about the myth of the beginning of time. There's this business of um, presenting any observations of nature in such a way that you feel confident that outside the range of the observations of nature that you've made, you can be confident you know what's going to happen. And so you get this, this, this effect um, where, where you, what, whatever, whatever happens as far as, um, what, whatever happens um, in terms of your measurements, uh, you measure some quantity x in nature. And you get some uh, relationship y between what you're measuring and the overall effect of that measurement, um, whatever process of nature it is, and you get a series of points. <coughs> now, if they don't fall on a straight line, and they hardly ever do, they're nearly all on some sort of a curve, um, you play around with the 
<laughs> mathematics of these two axes until you have got them on a straight line. You can, you can uh, take logarithms, you can um, use trigonom trigonom trigonometric functions, you can do all sorts of mathematical games until your data falls on a straight line. Because it's much easier to draw a line through a series of points than a curve. Although I've got a box still somewhere of, of curves. I think they had a special name. I can't remember what it is now. Um, a whole selection of curves um, made uh, mathematically, which you can use to fit curves to selections of points if you finally fail to get them onto a straight line, whatever you do with them. Now, the thing is that these points are, are obviously obtained within certain limits. The limits being, for want of a better word, x1 and x2. You can't, for some reason or other, in nature, measure the value of y outside of these two values of x1 and x2. Because perhaps the thing is inaccessible, perhaps it's too hot or too cold, or, or all sorts of reasons. And so, if you want to know the value of y at some value of x out here, either side of x1 and x2, you have to do what we call extrapolate. So you put your straight line not just through the points, but way beyond the points. So if you've got a value x here and you want to know what y is, you find out because you extrapolate. Now that is where all the trouble starts. Because very often, outside the range that you've measured um, at the, the values of y for values of x, um, you've made an assumption which isn't valid. That you can't, can't, in fact, assume that the straight line goes on here and that you can interpret the results in that way. And of course, this is the big, big problem when it comes to the beginning of time. Because it would be very simple, wouldn't it, to say, yes, oh well, we, we, we know how far the galaxies have travelled um, apart from each other. We know the speed that they're travelling, or we think we do, because of the redshift effect uh, uh, on light, and, and so on and so forth. You can say all these things, and therefore, ah, X million years ago, the universe began. But you can't say that because of the dangers that you're extrapolating so far back into the past that all sorts of things should change, could change, may well have changed in the process of the millions of years that have gone on since the beginning of time, or the potential beginning of time, to be more precise. And so I, th I think, a, a, I, I hope I've demonstrated enough there to show you the dangers of the scientific process. And also, of course, there is this huge problem which we come to all the time in esoteric science or in occultism or whatever you care to call it, um, that we're going beyond the scope of the human mind to deal with what we're wanting to deal with. The failure of the rational mind to measure or even comprehend the unfathomable. Which is what I was saying a few moments ago about the nature of the one that lies behind all existence that came out of the first fundamental proposition of theosophy in the secret doctrine. Um, and I, I wanted to just read this opening passage from a little book uh, called Out of the Silence by James Rhodes. And I think it's still for sale out there in the bookshop because it's a very famous little book in theosophy. And it's um, uh, all based upon 1 Corinthians 3.16. Uh, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth within you. And it was a favourite verse of the Anthony Hoskins who uh, preceded me as president of the Theosophical Society. And uh, I remember on one, one occasion, I was in a meeting like this, sitting somewhere out there, and she said, Colin, stand up and tell us what 1 Corinthians 3.16 is. And fortunately, I knew what 1 Corinthians 3.16 was, and I was able to tell everybody. But it, it is such an important verse in Theosophy. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth within you. And this little book, um, starts off like this. Is this thing true, the preacher saith, or but a dreamer's dream? 
thrills in thy way miss the breath that bade the star fires, fires stream, framed all the universe divine, and slowly, cell by cell, built up thy body for a shrine wherein himself might dwell. And that is deeply theosophical because, you know, we say that our own uh, human consciousness, in its essence, is a spark of the divine. And of course, if you uh, want to, to, to go to scripture um, for a moment longer, um, you have the, the opening of St. John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without it or him was not anything made that was made. And because, in a sense, uh, it, it's reinforcing the story of Genesis, but it's also reinforcing the story of theosophy. Because theosophy is saying there isn't anything that exists either in this physical universe or in the subjective realms of thought and imagination that lie behind this physical world that doesn't owe its origin to exactly the same source, the one. And it is, it is so desperately important to get hold of this point because it is only because of this point the, the Theosophical Society has got as its first object to form a nucleus of the universal brotherhood of mankind, without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or colour. It's, it, 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 the, the whole idea of brotherhood being a, a genuine, reasonable proposition stems from the fact that we all owe our origin to the same source. And not only us, but the whole universe. It's a huge, huge thing. But that isn't the end of the story, not that you expected it to be. Um, because just as the Theosophical Society has got three objects, so the secret doctrine has got three fundamental propositions, not one. I mentioned one. The second one is even more relevant to my theme tonight. And it reads like this. The eternity of the universe, note the word eternity, in toto, as a boundless plane. Periodically the playground of numberless universes incessantly manifesting and disappearing. The appearance and disappearance of worlds is like a, red, like a regular tidal ebb of flux and reflux. So what theosophy says is that everything is cyclic. Nothing has a real beginning or a real end at all. Because everything comes and goes as a sort of cyclic process. I mean, the story in Genesis, the beginning and the, 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 there was the beginning uh, when God separated the light from the darkness, there was the beginning and the end of the first day. It, it, somehow it seems anachronistic when you look at it from a, a, a deeper perspective to suggest that there ever was a first day. Well, I mean, obviously, as far as this earth is concerned, if that's what it's talking about, there must have been a first day. There must have been some point, mustn't there? Whether it happened when the earth was still a, a, a swirl of hot gas or whether it, when it was a liquefied or when it started to solidify, that it somehow got this strange angular velocity on it and started spinning once every 24 hours on its axis. Sometime it must have started. It didn't start when the earth was fully formed and just sitting there, and suddenly started to spin. You know, there obviously was a moment when it developed the spin as it cooled down and solidified into a planet. And as far as our lives are concerned, of course, we're totally dominated by the 24-hour clock. We have to go to sleep once every 24 hours, or if we don't, we pay for it. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the whole way in which we, our bodies function on this planet is that it has to be fed and slept at regular intervals, and it, it's a cyclic process. 
And a lot of people have argued, and I think reasonably argued, not conclusively argued, but reasonably argued, that if we are um, involved in a cyclic process of time in our daily living, why shouldn't we be involved in a cyclic process as far as our lives are concerned? That we live a human life for 70 or 80 years and die, and for a while perhaps we don't um, incarnate again, we come into another human life and we have this cycle of, of, of living and dying and living and dying. Um, there's a huge amount written about that in theosophy. And in fact, when you step out of time, um, you step into something called duration. And again, referring to Yancy Hoskins, um, she wrote a little book, a little booklet, called Time, Duration and Immortality. It's out there for sale in the bookshop. You can get one on your way out if you want to. And she drew the distinction between time and duration. And this is what, what I'm driving towards in this talk, to try and get you to see the difference between time and duration. Now, it's not as if this is a new idea. It's as old as the hills. I mean, uh, in Psalm 90, uh, verse 4, which goes back to at least 1000 BC, when King David was writing these psalms, so we're told, um, it, he writes these words, A thousand years are but as yesterday, when it is past, or as a watch in the night. And in another place it says, um, if I, uh, well, I really, we'll really leave that one for a moment, but come back to the, go to the New Testament in the second epistle of Peter, chapter 3 and verse 8, we read these words, with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So now we're breaking the boundary of our concept of time in, into an, a new era, into a new area. And in that area, I want you to come with me, otherwise this business about the, um, the, 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 the beginning of time won't, won't come to fruition. Yes, you can measure the whole of your life by watching your clock, watching, watching your watch. But your experience of time is entirely different to that, most of the time. Excuse the pun. Because, uh, let me suggest to you, and you, I'm sure you've all had this experience, and some of you have heard me use this analogy before, but I'm sure many haven't. You're standing at the bus stop on a cold, windy, wet night, and you really would have liked to have had two or three more layers of clothes on because it's going right through you and you're covered in goose pimples. <laughs> and the people around you are moaning because the bus is late. And you look at your watch, my goodness, yes. And it seems a, a huge age. You look at your watch again and only a minute has gone by. But it seems like an hour. And every minute you wait for that bus feeling so uncomfortable seems to you like an hour. Now you get home, you put on your party clothes, and you go off to the party at 8 o'clock in the evening. Before you know where you are, it's midnight. <laughs> it is. Because our, our appreciation of time is highly subjective. Even though we can be very objective about it, in splitting it up, the 24 hours up into little, little bits and synchronising with other people's watches and clocks, in fact, our appreciation of time is incredibly different. And if you've gone to bed at night and fallen into a really, really deep sleep and you, you've got thick curtains that don't let the light in and there aren't any sounds outside normally from traffic or anything like that, you can wake up and have no idea what the time is at all until you look at the clock. Because your appreciation of the passage of time while you've been asleep is virtually zero. So, when we're looking at time, um, we're looking at a very strange quantity. Our appreciation of it, and the way in which it works as far as the universe is concerned. The, 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 there's a theory come up in science now called string theory, 
Uh, and uh, those of you who, who follow uh, popular science magazines like New Scientist probably have heard a little bit about it. And it's, it's said in this article that string theorists expect that when one plays the history of the universe backwards in time, the curvature of space-time starts to increase. Now, I've already mentioned to you about the curvature of time, curvature of space, um, due to the effect of, 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 of um, gravitational fields. And suggestion is that as you come backwards in time, let's suppose now that instead of just x on this axis, I've got time. Hmm? Only about time on that axis. And that this is zero here. Well, if you were to take that line that I've drawn on the, on the chart, um, you can see that at zero time, the universe has got a finite size to it. If that line had been at a different angle and had come down through zero, you'd say, well, at the beginning of time there was no universe, there was nothing, because it goes through zero, but the chances of it going through zero are not very high. Unless you believe in the Big Bang Theory. If you believe in the Big Bang Theory, then that line has to go through zero. But what this man is saying is that supposing theosophy is right, and the whole process of everything is cyclic, not just our 24-hour clock and our lives and all the rest of it, but perhaps everything is cyclic, including the universe itself. Now, theosophists have got a strange word to describe the difference between the universe existing and not existing. And that is, they call the universe existing a manvantara, and the universe not existing, a liar. And so, theosophy has already come to terms with this. Um, this is esoteric science, you see. This is uh, where you can't prove anything, but where you have the knowledge somehow passed down through countless generations of seers from an interminable, interminable distance back in history that we can't even penetrate. So that the Big Bang may not have been the origin of the universe at all, but in fact, when you trace the, the history of this particular universe backwards in time, in the way that these string theorists are talking about, in fact, it comes, perhaps does come down to some finite size and then start expanding again. And, and, and so, instead of having a process that's a once-off, you have the good old sine wave, where it goes up and down and up and down forever. No beginning and no end. And you've seen the sine wave in all sorts of applications, you know, the, 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 this process of backwards and forwards, up and down. The electri electricity in our lights is doing that 50 times a second, uh, and you come across it in all sorts of other ways as well. And so the, 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 there is now postulated in science, uh, and in astrophysics, and by theoretical physicists, the idea that, not, that the Big Bang isn't the only theory to explain why the universe is the way it is that in fact the universe may have always existed and gone through this cyclic process of coming down to almost nothing, but just before it got down to nothing, it reversed and went the other way again. Now, of course, there are all sorts of other arguments that you can bring into play. I mean, you can say, well, um, the whole business about the galaxies expanding so fast uh, and so persistently over so many millions of years it is, is based upon evidence that we've gathered with our telescopes and measurements of, of the speed of recession of the galaxies, that is the speed at which they're flying apart, uh, and that the evidence we've collected may be false itself, <laughs> uh, and, and we may be barking up the wrong tree altogether, but that's always a danger in science. Um, I mean, science is, is um, always barking up the wrong tree and having to climb down again and climb, climb a different one, so it wouldn't be anything new. But the, 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 the whole um, suggestion, of the, the theory that's been accepted for at least the last 50 years in science, that the universe began with the Big Bang, um, is now up for grabs. It's now a different ballgame altogether. 
And this particular idea of cyclicity is a very, very compelling one. And what I wanted to particularly say to you tonight is that this falls directly in line with theosophical teaching. The second fundamental proposition that I read out to you a few moments ago is all about the idea that, um, uh, that everything is cyclic, even the existence of the universe itself. I mean, there are, he, to, to be fair on the man who wrote this article, he did put forward yet another suggestion which was different to this one, and he, uh, this one is even more difficult in a way because it deals with uh, suggesting that there are, uh, there's a type of space which has a higher number of dimensions than three. Now, all right, you, some people talk about time being in the fourth dimension, but I'm not talking about, about it in that category. I'm talking about the idea that there are other linear dimensions that can be built into the uh, a concept of space than three. And it's said, of course, in string theory that that demands uh, the, the existence of 21 dimensions. And there's a suggestion that if you go into higher dimensional space, you can have different universes virtually coexisting. And he suggests something which he calls D-brains, which um, it, it can occasionally collide and make it look as though the universe is starting with a Big Bang, but it's only a collision between two universes existing in different space-time continuums. But I don't really want to go a long way down that road because that is even more uh, contentious and um, theoretical and... Uh, so much more a postulate rather than, than a, uh, a fact that can be substantiated from observations than, than the one that I've just been majoring on in tonight's talk. It does say, um, and this has been observed in order to support this idea of the cyclicity of the universe, that um, during inflation, that is during the expansion of the universe, the curvature of space changes relatively slowly but that when it comes back again, and particularly as it comes down to these very dense regions, uh, near to the start of the universe, that the curvature of space-time of space -time increases very markedly, so that you become even more uncertain about what happens near the zero point, and it's not possible to really uh, perceive any more deeply um, in, into it than that. Having said all that, um, I, I, I do want to, to really end by saying that there is a third fundamental proposition in theosophy, and that is the one that I hinted at uh, slightly earlier in my talk, when I referred to the fact that it says that the absolute identity of every soul with the universal over soul, and, and the suggestion that in our highest level of consciousness, we are actually partaking of a universal consciousness. And that to some extent, um, when we pass out of this life uh, of three dimensions and time that we are living at the moment, we enter into some uh, realization of this higher reality uh, that is resulted in, uh, called in theosophical terms, the universal oversoul. That I really can't leave the subject of time without just saying a little bit about the theosophical concept of space. Because we're so, just as we are so used to our ordinary everyday use of time, so we're just as used to our everyday use of space. And I want to, ex to say to you that Blavatsky says on more than one occasion that outside of this particular a three-dimensional space-time continuum that we find ourselves living in on this planet, outside of that there is something called dimensionless space. Or in another place she calls it occult space, the hidden space. The space that you can exist in when you die. That your consciousness doesn't need space and time for its existence. There is something, there is this spark, not only of the divine, but also of eternity in each one of us. And these things are very relevant to us. They may not be relevant to us now, but they are with someone we love dies, or if we're approaching our own death, 
that these sorts of thoughts are incredibly important. That it's not that, that we're going to die and hang around the earth looking at how everyone else is getting on, or we're going to go off and, 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 and live on Mars or Jupiter, or, or go out to some part of the Milky Way and live there. Um, we're, there's no suggestion of that. I mean, the, 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 can I refer just a moment to the way that the church and people in the world of, at large, um, certainly in the, uh, in, in the European, Asiatic, um, Indo-China part of the world, uh, thought for, for centuries that, that there was a three-tier universe, that this universe I've been talking about, the Big Bang, was really just three tiers. There was the, the, the heavens, which were just a canopy shielding heaven from view, uh, it just happened a bits of light from heaven came through various holes, which we call the stars. That there was the earth that we live on that was flat, and that underneath were these terrible fires uh, of hell. Uh, you know, Copernicus and um, um, Galileo both uh, were propounding the idea uh, that we all uh, accept these days that the earth. Uh, spins on its axis and rotates around the Earth once a year and is part of a solar system that uh, is one of many solar systems. Um, and that you can't say heaven is up there because if you were standing in Australia and saying heaven was up there, you'd be pointing in exactly the opposite direction. <laughs> so the whole thing is complete nonsense. In fact, it's total nonsense. It's rubbish. And it's no wonder that so many people throw out religion with the bathwater because these ideas are total nonsense. What isn't nonsense is the idea that there's another realm of existence outside of time and space. Mm. Mm. And, and why could you be dead for a thousand years and come be reborn and, and, and believe it was almost yesterday that you last lived on this planet? Because if there's nothing happening during those thousand years, it won't seem like a thousand years, it will seem like a day. Anyway, I, I, perhaps I, I've said enough uh, to, to stimulate your thoughts and, and, and give you some uh, uh, missiles to throw at me in the way of questions um, <laughs> with those uh, various thoughts I've given you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Colin, very much. Does anybody have a question for Colin? I've got a question. Lovely talk. You mentioned the Red Shift. If I'm right, that was defined in the 1920s by the American astronomer Edwin Hubble. Could you just reconsider what that is? I'm, I, I like, I'm not quite sure what it is. I know it's very significant. Yeah, well, in the old days, uh, in the good old days, if you stood on Wimbledon Railway Station and, and, and listened to the um, uh, Bournemouth Bell go through or something, um, or the Devon Bell for that matter, um, uh, and it whistled as it went through the station, you heard this incredible change in pitch. Yeah. Um, it started off a uh, high pitch, and as the train came through the station and went down the road to Surbiton, it changed pitch, went down almost an octave, if not more. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is a very simple one, is that as the train was coming towards you, at perhaps 100 miles an hour, which is, and the speed of sound is only 700 miles an hour, so you know, it was a very reasonable proportion of the speed of sound. As the, as the, the train came towards you, um, all the sound was being pushed up close together, and it was a higher, and therefore you heard it as a higher frequency. If you'd been sitting on the train, of course, you'd hear the same sound all the time. But because it was coming towards you, it was coming, it, the sound was arriving in bigger uh, lumps than it would normally have done. But when it's going away from you, it's all stretched out. It's taking longer for the sound to come to your ears. And so it's a lower pitch. Now, the red shift is exactly the same as that, except that instead of sound, we're talking about light. Now, the, 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 the electromagnetic spectrum, as it's called, has only got this tiny little window in the middle of it, which is visible light. And it's, as you well know, as far as our eyes are concerned, that visible light, uh, it, when it's under normal daylight conditions, is white light. We call it white light. And you only know its colours if it gets um, refracted through the rainbow, uh, or you put it through a prism or something like that, and split it into the various colours. 
which is only just different wave bands, like the wave bands on your old radio that you used to tune, or you still got them perhaps on your car radio, are these different wave bands. All you're doing is looking at the different wave bands instead of the whole lot at once. And so you see the colours. Now what happens when the universe is expanding is that the, this is the theory, I'm not saying it's true, but it's been widely accepted by science for the best part of a hundred years, as you say, is that because the galaxies are moving away from us so fast, the light is taking longer to get to us, and therefore it seems to be at a lower frequency. And it so happens that the red end of the spectrum is a lower frequency than the blue end, or whatever you call it, ultraviolet light or whatever is a higher frequency than the red end. Right. And that's the reason. Because the observations through the telescopes are all that the light is red, is reddish. And so they've interpreted it to mean that the galaxies are flying away from each other at an enormous speed. And they've worked it out, they've done the calculations. You can do the mathematics, it's not very complicated mathematics. Um, but the the now, because of the, the, the crisis of, of confidence that was created by finding, uh, to everyone's uh, 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 astonishment and, and, and consternation, that Newton's laws were not totally infallible, people are saying, well, you know, the interpretation of the red shift, is that really the true interpretation, or is there some other interpretation? And if it's the wrong interpretation, perhaps the galaxies are not flying away from each other at millions of miles an hour or something. That you know that some there's some other entirely different uh, view of the universe possible. And it may well be that in a hundred years' time there'll be people uh, doing a lecture like this who say, "Those poor people back in 2008, how, how wrong they were." But when you come to theosophy and esoteric science, no one has ever said that. No one has ever said that. Although this theory goes down through Plato and Aristotle and, uh, and, and Her um, Her um, Hermes, uh, Tremiscus in Egypt and, 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 and the great religions of the world, no one has ever said esoteric science is wrong. Because esoteric science has always actually been overtaken by conventional science. You know, at a time when scientists were saying that the atom was infinitely, was, was, was totally indivisible, was the smallest building brick of matter, Blavatsky was saying that it was infinitely divisible. And within 50 years of her death, uh, the, 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 the science had completely changed its tune from sneering at her, they had had to admit that she was right and they were wrong. And that's just one example of the many ways in which uh, science has had to sooner or later come to terms with the truth as expressed in esoteric science. And so it, I have tremendous confidence that, um, uh, that if you're asked the question, what happened before the Big Bang? You can say, ah, but it wasn't really a Big Bang as you understand it, it was only a reversal. That from converging, the universe from converging in on itself, it started to expand again. It wasn't really a Big Bang at all because it had been doing it for time immemorial. It goes back into the mists of, uh, of, um, of, of the cosmos. And in fact, you can go even further than that and say that there are times when the universe goes out of existence altogether, and that is a different game altogether. But that really requires another talk, because that is a huge different subject. Yes? Um, as you say, you, um, it was Newton that started off the mechanical view of the universe, and then Einstein came and said, well, you've got to put space-time time into the equation. Mm -hmm. And scientists are even saying now that you've got to put something else into the equation, which is consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. And I even read that they're talking about that the universe may be a kind of a hologram. Yeah. We're, we're a microcosm, a macrocosm. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. what we see is a function of our mind. That's right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's a different world of thought altogether. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you, you were talking about the world being finite. Were you by that meaning that the world is not infinite but is, is a limited dimension? Are you saying that? No, no, I'm, I'm not talking about the world when I said that. Or, or the cosmos, the, the space, I mean, the space. space. 
that nobody, I mean, as far as I know, and I stand to be corrected if anyone knows better, as far as I know, Professor Lovell never, ever achieved his dream. Oh, right. <laughs> he built this wonderful telescope, but he never actually determined whether the universe was finite. He never able to say it was X miles wide or, or, or no, whatever. I don't think so. Because um, otherwise, it, that, that wouldn't make sense if, it, if he could have done that, wouldn't it? Because I mean, if, if he says, oh yes, it's so, 70,000 miles wide, to put it in simple terms, yeah. then you say, well, what's beyond that? I think a brick wall would stay. Uh, <laughs> well, no silence, you see. If, yeah. if you go out beyond the point at, to, which the unit, to which the galaxies of stars and, and, and solar systems have uh, expanded, yeah. um, uh, then you not only get uh, the, the non-appearance of light, yeah. but you can't really rely upon it because yeah. the light at that distance is not really well, uh, understandable. It, but with radio waves, you see, yeah, you would, yeah, right. and you could get, you would expect to get silence. Yeah, silence but yeah. even if you got silence, it's only an assumption yeah. that that, you're, that the silence is because of that, yeah. and not because of some other reason. Yeah, so yeah. you know, the, the the ground is always shifting. Yeah, you, yeah. you you can never be sure about these things mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Didn't I read somewhere that light, uh, or Einstein said that light always seems to travel at the same speed irrespective of where you are in relation to it? How does that fit in with the redshift? Um, they're two different things entirely. The speed of light and the frequency of light are two different things. The speed of light is the speed at which it propagates uh, acro across space. Yep. 186,000 miles per second. So it always seems to, whether it's coming towards you or away from you, it always seems to be travelling at that speed, but the wavelength is different. Exactly. 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 Um, I mean, it, it all depends where the observer is. I mean, it, as far as the observer is concerned, it, it's travelling at 186,000 miles per, square, per second. Yes. So when we see Andromeda coming towards us at 500,000 miles a, a minute or something, what do we get for an hour? <coughs> That then uh, would have a different shift, or would have a, a lighter shift. Well, you'd imagine that if, that if a galaxy was coming towards you, it would have a blue shift, not blue. a red shift. But as far as I understand it, there isn't such a thing. Oh. That every single galaxy is expanding away from every other galaxy in all three dimensions of space at such a speed that they're always all recession. Andromeda's coming towards us, so it's going to collide. Well, if, if it's uh, just a part of the Milky Way, that wouldn't count. It's not. No, it wouldn't count because it's we're not talking. Part of the Milky we're, Way no, again. no, we're talking about galaxies. We're not talking. But it's a separate galaxy. We're, we're talking about within the, the particular galaxy. Um, yeah, that's the sister galaxy is uh, well, like millions of years, even at five hundred thousand. Well, miles you have an advantage over me there. <laughs> you have an advantage over me because I wasn't aware that Andromeda was coming towards us. But if it is coming towards us, it would depend an awful lot on the speed at which it's coming towards us for it to be an observable effect. If it's coming, to, coming towards us relatively slowly in comparison to the speed at which the galaxies are receding from us, um, then the, the shift, that even though it was a slight shift, a blue shift, it may not be measurable with our instruments. doesn't mean to say it's not there, but in terms of the significance of the red shift, the, the blue shift would be very difficult to see if it's a slow approach. So I would need to know the relative speed at which Andromeda is approaching us compared with the speed at which the galaxies are receding from each other in order to know it's whether it would be reasonable to expect to see a blue shift or not. Even 500,000 miles an hour is insignificant compared with the other speeds. With the speed of light, yes. Mm. Mm. Y yes. Um, as far as I, I understand this, um, the, the mutual recession is actually only between galactic clusters, but That's not right. necessarily between the galaxies within them. Now, Andromeda, as far as I know, is a separate galaxy but it is within the galactic cluster, ah. and therefore it is permissible by the rules, so to speak, that it can approach, and that it does in fact have a blue shift. But the, the, um, the, the, the clusters, the superclusters themselves, are all receding from each other, and therefore they have a red shift. Well, you see, there you've got a, another level of, of, of understanding. Um, if the, these uh, uh, galaxies are in clusters, then that would explain it. Anybody else? Any more questions? No? We've still got time to spare. <laughs> got, we don't normally finish till half past, so you've still got time. Yes? 
every year I like to look at the various stars in the sky and their positions, relation to each other. Of course, the Orion constellation is well known, as well as when I look at it, I look at the star series as well. And they always seem to come up each year in the same position in relation to each other that they have always been. In my astronomy book, they are marked down on maps. Now, uh, assuming that uh, they're going to be the same in relation to each other forever a day. Does this, um, is this going, can you guarantee that this will always be the case? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to address the same stars in 30 years' time in exactly the same position. Mm. Well, the point is that 30 years or 100 years is nearly nothing uh, in relation to the 26,500 or whatever it is, year cycle, um, uh, which in, in which the whole um, heavens turn in relation to our observation point. Um, I've forgotten it's not as... Uh, the, 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 the cycle of precession, I think it's called, or something, some word like that. My friend John Gordon would be much more eloquent than I am on this particular point. But if you look at the, the, the life, we're talking about millions and millions of years. We're talking about the time that this light has taken to get to us in terms of being millions of years at 186,000 miles a second. It's, so what we see as we look up into the sky, and a lot of people don't realise this, what we see when we look up into the sky is what the universe looked like thousands, if not millions of years ago. Yeah, yeah. The universe isn't anything like that now. Mm -hmm. But it's taken all this time for the light to come to us um, of what the universe was like then. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows what the universe is like now at all because of the, the, they'll have to wait millions of years for the light to come from wherever it is now, and then it'll be old, old mm -hmm. information, because the universe will be something different. You, is that, is that, you know, you have to, I mean, as soon as you start to really go breaking beneath the surface of our knowledge, you realise just how, how complex. Uh, well, not only complex, but how fragile it is. Mm -hmm. how, how it's built upon so many assumptions. Just a minute, someone right at the back first. Yes? Yes, I'm going to... Unfortunately, throw another spanner in the works. Because <laughs> I've, uh, I've actually just uh, been studying uh, as far as I'm able, because I'm very busy. Um, I've been quite obsessed with time for many years. And then through various studies, I've realised um, many ancient traditions, the Toltecs and the Tibetan uh, yogis, the dream, they study dream yoga, it's called. Um, what, when you get into it, what they're really saying is that um, there's a big connection between time, dreamings, which is a, a ambiguous word, and death. And what we're all looking for, enlightenment. If you work hard enough at it, and it does, it probably involves lucid dreaming, is the meaning of enlightenment is actually understanding that the whole lot is, if you can call it an illusion, but the whole lot of it is that our, we have a limited perception. And it's a fascinating subject, and it, it, it links all these areas, time, um, dreaming, which means seeing or understanding, and then death, because the way I see it is we're prepared, if a wise man is really preparing to die, and if you know how to die, then you, you, you don't come back, basically. That seems to be what they mean by enlightenment. Sorry to do that, but it's very interesting. Once you start, it's difficult. Once you start getting into that area, it, it sort of starts to explain the incongruities, if you see what I mean. Yeah, well, so it makes it more complicated, but it also um, starts to answer some very difficult questions. Yes, well, this, this is the business all the time. We're, we're curious, mm -hmm. because we find ourselves, as we live a human life, in, in, in a situation where we don't really know where we came from, or really where we're going, and, or what we're doing here at all. I mean, the whole thing is, is so surrounded by mystery that, that all these um, theories and ideas that people put forward are, are, are fascinating because they, they, they might just possibly be giving us a slight uh, viewpoint on, on a, a vista of, of knowledge that we're, we're totally unaware of. And this question of dreams is a really important one that you've raised. 
because it's said by those that study dreams that although they seem to drag on and on, particularly if they're nasty dreams, uh, for hours and hours, in fact they're all over in a few seconds. And it, it reminds me of the business about uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, near-death experience, the, the people who, who are resuscitated when they're near death. Um, many of them report that at a sudden moment in this death process, they saw the whole of their lives flash before them. Now, that is staggering, isn't it? Because very often people who are dying, are, 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 their brains are pretty knocked out. You know, they, they, maybe they're starved of oxygen or something, and, and they've lost their memory, they couldn't tell you the name of the king or queen of England, and they couldn't tell you what day of the week it is, and who's the prime minister. All these things that are used to test a person's um, awareness, and um, whether they're compass mentis or not, um, would, wouldn't work, would they? they they, they score zero, but suddenly they see the whole of their lives flash before them. And it, 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 it reinforces all the theosophical teaching about, mm. about memory and astral light and mm. the true memory of, uh, of events not being uh, deposited in our brain cells but in another realm, in this <laughs> occult space again that I was mentioning a, a, a moment ago. So, you know, there are whole areas of, of deep uh, connecting interest to, to the subject I've used tonight to do with the death process and so on, and, and, and rebirth, and, and But the thing terrific. is that you can actually, uh, if you get personally involved by doing certain practices, you actually, um, you can, you know, you can, act, you can actually move forward. Literally, it's not intellectual, you have to, you, you do things and you have experiences that explain things, not intellectually. So it's quite, you know, it's quite gratifying that there are sort of things you can do about these. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it, it, you see, the, the whole business of the mystic is that the mystic is able to, to do just what you're saying mm -hmm. and enter another, enter another realm of consciousness, yeah. which is quite abnormal, which yeah. most of us don't achieve at all as we go through life. Or if we do achieve it, we achieve it only for a few seconds somewhere or other. Um, it, and, and the mystic is actually going to get into that area and a lot of the things that I've hinted at in tonight's talk rather than dealt with in any thorough sort of way uh, would, would, be, would become knowledge to them because they've seen it all you know, they've been there they've been to Narnia and come back again you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's lovely yeah. Yes, one more question. Time for one more question. Yes, I've worked this out. This is a relatively simple thing, and yet I still can't get my mind around it. <clears throat> the furthest objects which are now visible to super telescopes, they say, stretch back almost to the Big Bang. They're so far away. But that's not where they really are. Yeah. Where they really are, we'll put it back before the Big Bang. No, 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 no. Where they really are might, well, they might be a, a long, long further, further greater distance out into space. All that time they've got that much further. They've so got they that much further. Back before the, I mean, if you've got 12,000 million years away of what they appear to be, or where they were 12,000 million years ago, and the Big Bang was only 14,000 million years. Ah, but that's a terrible assumption. I said that is a terrible assumption to assume that the Big Bang was 14,000 well, million no, years ago. Popular figure. Yeah, but it, you see, the, the whole business about the popularity of the Big Bang theory is now is, is now um, up for grabs. It's, it's no it's no longer accepted as as, as the definitive quickly, answer. Is it? Well, relatively like, quickly, I, I think. The yeah. Well, I, mean, I know this 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 um, article um, that that in in the, in the, the in, in this magazine was goes back to oh at least five or six years uh, May two thousand and four so it's not that old no, not not that recent but but I mean the scientists are much more humble uh, most the, the the theoretical scientists than they were a hundred years ago I remember my my physics master at school saying to me on one occasion he said he said you know he said that at the turn of the century, that was the 19th to the 20th, um, he said uh, scientists, particularly theoretical physicists, were discussing whether there was much more knowledge to be acquired. <laughs> yeah. yeah, They really were seriously discussing it. It was a, it was a, it was a debating point. It was. Uh, and, and now, um, you know, we're so, we're so uncertain outside the, 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 the part of nature that we've observed 
in these extrapolated areas. We're so uncertain because we, we got caught with our pants down so many times that, that, that really um, no one's got any, any, any faith in belts or braces, you know, I mean, I'll think. <laughs> <laughs> and on that wonderful note, <laughs> I'm going to 